Okay. Good evening. Um, welcome to Asia Society Hong Kong Center. I am Alice Mong, Executive Director of Asia Society Hong Kong Center, and it is my great pleasure. Um, I'm not going to talk about COVID-19 today. I'm <laughs> going to be talking about um, our wonderful site, uh, Asia Society Hong Kong Center, the site that was beautifully designed for us uh, by Todd Williams and Billy Tsien, our architect. Um, and the reason we had uh, picked um, this year, uh, well, I've been wanting, I've actually had the pleasure of interviewing um, and speaking with Billy and Todd in New York a few years ago when our Heritage Reveal book came out. And for me personally, this is, we're in some ways celebrating uh, anniversary. It was 20, about 20 years ago, um, Billy and Todd first visited the site. They had been in Hong Kong before, but this was the first time um, this, uh, con this jungle, not just concrete jungle, but this jungle uh, was uh, visited. And, and I don't think uh, since then, as many of you know, we've transformed Asia Society Hong Kong with uh, Billy and Todd's great help into this uh, magnificent center that I'm, I have the uh, pleasure of being the executive director for the last eight years. So we're really, really delighted. Uh, Todd and Billy is in, uh, joining us from New York. And with me um, tonight uh, is Florence Chen, architect, uh, AIA Hong, HKIA uh, of Hong Kong, who's gonna co-moderate. Uh, Professor Chen, and also an architect <laughs> herself, will be co-moderating this discussion with me um, tonight. But I'm gonna really leave the, the hard work uh, to Florence, been, since she is an expert, uh, she's an architect uh, herself. And so the title of this event is Architecture as Vision, uh, and in conversation with Todd and, uh, and Billy. And so I'm going to hand it over uh, to Florence to formally introduce our speaker and then to get the formal presentation started. And then Florence and I will come back uh, uh, after the presentation with Q&A, with conversation, and also getting uh, the audience, uh, those of you who are online, uh, whether you're in New York, San Francisco, Hong Kong, or wherever you are uh, joining us, please send in your question and we will um, do our best to ask them uh, to our um, experts. So I'm going to hand it over. Florence, thank, thank you, you for Alice. being here. Thank you, Alice. And good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm representing American Institute of Architect Hong Kong chapter tonight. It's my great honor to be Introducing our speaker of this evening webcast, um, Todd and Billy, the architects behind the Asia Society Hong Kong Center. Uh, the husband and wife team was founded in 1986. Um, they are headquartered in Hong Kong. The studio focuses on works for institutions, including schools, museums, as well as not-for-profit organizations. And for people who really value aspiration and meanings, timelessness, and also beauty. Um, in addition to the Asia Society Hong Kong Center, some of their most notable work, including the Lefrick Center at Lakeside in Brooklyn, as well as the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. Over the past three decades, their works has been recognized by a number of awards and also citations, including over two dozens of AIA awards uh, given by the American Institute of Architects. Both of them have been inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters, National Academy, as well as the American Academy of Arts and Science. I recall my first time visiting the Asia Society Hong Kong Center. Um, my immediate impression was that the building has always been there, um, even the day before they were open. And it's so well integrated into the landscape that I felt like the site cannot go without this building. Um, Todd and Billy work speaks about buildings and its surroundings. They prioritize spatial experience over physical form. And their attention to details and materiality are unmatched and absolutely poetic. Their ability to finesse between the tangible and the intangible make their works very unique in our time. Um, with this, I'm going to hand it over to our speaker tonight, Todd Williams and Billy Zen. Um, thank you. Oh. Thank you. This is a, a great delight for us to be with you, even if it's uh, not per personally, but it, we're reaching many more people, I hope. And uh, we hope everyone is well. We're thrilled to give you a little bit of the story of the Asia Society and the way we think about architecture. We'll do that with two projects, the Asia Society, uh, which is a primary source of our interest this evening, but also the uh, Obama Presidential Center. So we'll give you a look at that and the thinking behind that. 
One of the things I wanted to say is that um, the Asia Society and Hong Kong has always had a very special place in my heart because I've always felt like a bridge person. So growing up uh, in America as uh, Chinese, but in a non-Chinese suburb, I felt that I always wanted to feel connected to both sides. And I think the Asia Society is a way there's connection to both sides. So we're actually gonna start with the, with the history of the project. And as we um, begin, we wanted to also talk just for a second about the four people that were so instrumental in making this happen from the very beginning. There's the sort of unstoppable team of Jack Wadsworth, Chan Lee, and um, Ronnie Chan, who's still steering the boat, and uh, Mary Lee Turner. And working with Grace Chang in Hong Kong, um, it, was, it was really a labor of love. And so we, now we start. Uh, we're going to say next because uh, our associate, many miles away, is going to actually operate this series of images. Uh, if we can make that full screen. Okay, next. next. Next, Greg. Thank you. And, next. and next. So 2000, uh, as Billy, okay, thank, next, next image, please. Okay, uh, this site is, is marked here uh, in an image, I believe from 2016 uh, with a rectangle. It's uh, in the middle level there in Hong Kong. And it actually is a very lush, generally a very, very lush area of an extraordinary island. Next. In uh, 1866, it was even more part of a jungle. Uh, where actually, I believe there wasn't that much foliage on the island at that exact time. You'll see images, but you can see its location. And of course, the harbor, the land is filled well out into the harbor at this point. Next. Interestingly, the roads are still very much, some of the critical roads are still very much there. Uh, the view basically from approximately the site in 1870 shows the Victoria Barracks and the incredible, actually, uh, presence of the British at that time. Well, the water also, of course, was a lot closer, um, but as the, the um, landfill sort of extended the, the the edge of the land. Um, it was very important and it was very close to, relatively close um, to the ships in the water. Next. 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 Then the view from Kowloon to the island, a tiny red dot, very generally approximately where the, the site is. Next. And then our, our first encounter with uh, Hong Kong was to come to the Chinese University for a lecture actually in 1994, where we flew into Kai Tak Airport. And this juxtaposition still is vivid in anyone's mind to experience that plane landing amidst the, uh, the towers, kind of the juxtaposition of mountain tower and old Hong Kong. And the Kong. incredible density of the city next. Next, Greg. Slow. It must be slow. Okay. We should move. Yeah, the site, again, this is, I, I think, again, is around 2016. Uh, seems to be Im embedded in the green, which it certainly is, but it's also in the midst of towers. Next. So certainly what struck us was um, the verticality of the city. It's more vertical than really any city we've experienced in the US. And then behind it, the verticality of, of the green. Next. And that uh, incredible uh, escalator that runs up the hill. Uh, amidst the energy of, of Hong Kong. Really, I've never loved an escalator so much as this one uh, with the steps alongside it and the commerce next to it, ascending into the top of the peak. 
Next. So these are these are first impressions in many ways. Another very early impression that we were it was quite unexpected was the power of the of the rain. Uh, those of you who live in Hong Kong will probably know this, but we were introduced to the fact that rain is named amber, red, and, and black, and the black rain is, of course, the most severe. Perhaps there's something even greater ahead. I hope uh, I hope not. But uh, to experience that's extraordinary, and that when the sun comes out, we're very much aware of the power of the sun and the humidity. So that was one of the most important aspects of the of the site that remained with us uh, and has remained with us during the design. Next. Nature. The, and the need to um, be protected from nature, both to experience it and to um, have refuge from it. So this is a, a drawing that I did, which talks about how the British essentially created a platform, a flattened area on the mountainside. And um, as towers grew up around it, uh, we tried to think of what would be a good uh, expression for the Asia society, which is both of Asia, but at the same time different from what's around it. Next. Are the, the Asia, three, three teams, many of teams applied for this project, but three teams uh, actually competed. And uh, we, I wish we could be showing you the other two uh, competition Results. One of them was by Sana, or the, the Pritzker Prize winner, Sejima, who had a very different take on the site than we did. And, uh, and another dear friends of ours, uh, architects from Barcelona, uh, Jose uh, Luis and, uh, and uh, Luis Torres. Luis Torres. Uh, at any rate, the, the Asia Society sent us models and we were asked to place our design in, in the physical model that they gave us. And what you can see here is the basic idea. It looks a little like an aircraft carrier and in particular the other, but the white buildings are all the buildings that are historic. There are two, as one knows, having visited the site, two very interesting berms that separate the munitions structures from the rest of it. And uh, essentially what we attempted to do was to thread our horizontal building amidst uh, the other, the horizontality of the site, but amidst the vertical towers. A really important aspect of the site is the nulla. So the stream, um, the water rushes down, particularly in the rains um, through the channel. And those of you in Hong Kong know the nullas. Um, but what is very powerful when you're there is the sound of water when it is running. Even when it's not running heavily, you can always hear the sound of water running through the nulla. So the bridge is, the building is a kind of bridge across the Nella from one side um, to the other side, um, and it crosses over that channel. And yes. in that first visit, we walked through Hong Kong Park and we're delighted by the, being able to move horizontally between these hills and valleys. Um, next. One of the things I think um, that we... This is a watercolor for part of our presentation, which was made in 2001, September 2001. What were you going to say, Billy? Next. 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 So, I wonder whether we ought to just simply assume that. Uh, so, um, prior to that, we had visited uh, actually, we had visited my grandmother in China in the very, very late 70s. But we spent a lot of time in um, gardens um, and looking at gardens. And so we had seen other bridges, of course, crossing water. Um, it's very important in a Chinese garden. Well, one of the inspirations is not only the horizontal uh, nature of the Chinese gardens, but also the number of kinds of things that one can explore and find in a garden, from serenity to activity. Uh, to secrets, uh, and this we took with us on, on the journey when we went to Hong Kong, but actually it still is part of our work uh, wherever we go. This idea of um, not always the straight path, of things that take you by surprise, of uh, gardens where there are openings and walls where you can see through to uh, a kind of another garden, perhaps even a garden that you can't get to. So this idea of, of layering, I think, very important 
in, yeah, in all of our work. It's embedded in the work. Next. Uh, the diagram of the pieces of the, of the site really was not legible at first. We should go to the next slide, but you can see from 1940 to the earliest building occurring in 1853, and then the two green berms that separate the site, and Billy has indicated the nullah, or the rushing water that is channeled, running basically right through the site. It's a quite an amazing site with uh, the delight uh, the lights of nature being so ever present. And we decided we should try to amplify that to whatever extent we could. The platform you can see is that upper rec rectangle there next, and a more, a later model where we began to understand the, the greenery. And you can see the bridge here now is no longer a direct connection, but it's an elbow bridge. I mean, one of the reasons was also because we found that there were uh, fruit bats living in the trees. Um, that would have had to have been cut down if we made a straight bridge and the fruit bats were endangered. And so um, one of uh, a kind of very uh, quite dear and, per, and brusque person named Patrick Chung who was managing the project um, sort of said, you, you can't cut down the trees. And so we made then the angled bridge next. Unfortunately, exactly, literally exactly at 9.03 p.m. <clears throat> when we were there, the three competitors were at dinner in Hong Kong, we decided we would take the other, whoever would lose, we would treat them to dinner. So we're sitting at a round table in a Chinese restaurant and one of the members got a phone call that a plane, she had, her brother had been walking across the Brooklyn Bridge and a plane hit the Twin Towers. And, wasn't long before we we learned much more about this, but this felt like, in a way, the end of the world to many of us. So, at a time when <clears throat> obviously we're troubled by COVID and and the struggles that are occurring around the world, uh, it's it's shocking to think that this event occurred so recently and marked precisely the time that we uh, had won the competition for the Asia Society. Yes. It's interesting when you look back and think nothing could ever be the same, and of course it isn't, but there's a great deal of positive that always occurs. Uh, this is an image of the site you can see in 2004, a subsequent visit. You can see down in winding in the lower right, the, the nulla, in this case slightly filled with what, just a small trickle in a way compared with what it sometimes has. Next the power of the jungle and then the concreted surface to prevent landslides. Uh, the nature of the buildings when we first saw them, actually this is a little later, but trees were growing out of the centers of all of the old buildings. This is the 1853 uh, laboratory. Laboratory. Building. It really felt like you were entering into kind of Raiders of the Lost Ark, like an Indiana Jones movie to us because it was so otherworldly in the middle of the most bustling and sort of dense city that we've ever been to, suddenly you came upon this building and it was a ruin. And But, but I mean, we were, in a way, the two other competitors chose something that was going to be quite unlike. We were taming the jungle, whereas we thought, you know, let the jungle prevail. Embrace the jungle. Embrace it. So next. Uh, we had our scheme from the moment we actually saw the site was in a way in our head. That rarely happens. A number of years later, we can see the buildings being restored, re reworked. Um, in the left lower corner, you can see that we actually, had, I think in that image, we were cutting into a mechanical plant into the earth. So all of the mechanical services are, are below grade. The buildings are viewed from above, so we wanted the tops to be beautiful wherever one looked down. Next. I think one of the um, important things about the uh, historic buildings is that they've been very, very carefully restored. So we worked with um, um, Ivan Ho, who was a very, uh, 
you know, careful um, person involved in restoration of buildings to make sure that the details and the materials, I mean, we use teak windows, um, were very true to what existed. Well, relatively past. little of that had occurred by the year 2000. And so this was still, at that time, it was a kind of a, a, one of the first attempts to try to really respect the history. In fact, many of us want to erase, erase the history. Uh, and I think increasingly we'll have to accept and embrace it and, uh, and believe in the power of history. Well, and to rather than always build new, in order to think about resources to try to understand what we can do with what we have so that we um, do more with less. But looking down on the site, one of the most important thing, aspects is that you don't see huge mechanical equipment as you actually do see, I think that is the British consulate across the street or mm. possibly the no, hotel. It's a, no, it's the British consulate. Um, and we worked very hard because we knew we were going to be a horizontal building in this vertical city. And we knew that one of the most important uh, faces of the building would be seen by people in the towers all around. And that is the roof next. Mm. So it really became, became the springboard for a solution. The separation of the rooftop from the, uh, the roof level of the lower GG block 1940 allows us to come across, create a very quiet building in the landscape and connect with the lower side. You can see the mechanical is fully buried either under one of the magazines or in the platform itself. The berms, for those who don't know, are there in, in case the, the magazine A and B or even the lab building would have an explosion so that it wouldn't uh, essentially destroy the entire site or affect greater parts of the city. So they actually were storing black powder in the magazines. Next. Stone was uh, an immediately uh, a material we thought of and, and often think of. In this case, we have, uh, I think it's stone on the right from Stonecutters Island and on the left, you've, if you've gone to the site, you'll see that we use a kind of picture stone, uh, which we've always been charmed by, whether we see it in furniture Chinese, uh, older Chinese uh, furniture as, as elements bind together the landscape with the piece in which you're sitting. So we certainly did a good deal of research and ultimately found a quite beautiful green stone. It's uh, I'm from Vietnam, I think. Next. It's very much about connecting to the jungle. So um, one of the earlier buildings, I think this was built in the 40s in its original state, next. Just an administration building, uh, quite an ordinary building, but we thought the ordinary should be embraced as well as the extraordinary. In fact, if you have an image of us late, before, we're, we're also spending our time right here uh, sheltering in a, in a munitions, what was once a munitions building in a fort right outside of uh, New York City. Uh, here, the, the GG, the white building is the GG block. The retaining wall with the Asia Society on it is a simple Chinese stone, black stone. And then the Asia, the new building is very distinct and clear as kind of horizontal ship in the landscape. The Banyan tree that was once running through the GG block now extricated and, and part of it growing on the, on the side. So we tried to keep as much Next. as we could. So here you see the green stone um, and it is a kind of, um, I, you know, there are many names for it, but they call it um, rainforest. Um, and also this idea as you walk into the main uh, space of the, um, Age Society building that there is that Chinese garden. So um, those of you who are familiar with the typology of seeing these um, moon uh, sort of windows or gates where one can look through but not necessarily go. And so this is an idea of looking through, hearing the sound of water, which is you'll see in just a minute, but has um, also a sense of withholding and mystery and privacy. Next. As one passes through the glass, you turn to your right and then you step back outside and you 
are immediately aware that the entire sound of the city is quieted, that you can hear birds and you can hear the rush of water, some of which is plunging through from a rooftop water feature that we've created into a vessel here. And the rest of it is the nullah that actually is running directly below our feet. So it, it's an instant idea that uh, you enter a new world, a world of quiet and of peace. Next. Of exploration. I think um, it was very important to us um, and to the Asia Society really that we um, create an oasis um, because there are so very few um, really breaks from the city. Of course, there's Hong Kong Park, but and the aviary winding through. But I think um, we all realize, um, and we in New York too, how much we appreciate any sort of green space um, where you can uh, just be and be alone, more alone, um, with your own thoughts. Next. So the Asia Society's mission <clears throat> really at this time began to be turned even more toward the issue of the arts, of, of history, of the inclusion of, of all people and voices. Uh, it certainly also has a relationship to business and what's happening in the current events in the world, but it's really here. This is a chance uh, for all people of all stripes and types to come and simply find themselves uh, in, in the jungle, as Billy indicates. You'll, if you've been there, you'll see that there's a bridge that passes through the very steep topography on that bridge also carries the services uh, between the buildings as well as allows the whole site to be accessible. So there's an upper and lower bridge, once again, thinking of the need for protection during um, the black rains next. And at the same time, I think that there's also this idea of a path, um, the sort of covered path next that uh, you see in Chinese gardens. There is a, a way of walking through and observing the nature around you, but at the same time, you're also um, held sort of separate and protected from it. Um, and in this case, sort of floating above and looking back through uh, the main Asia Society building to the existing buildings around you next. The, the lower portion of the canopy, the underside of the canopy is important. So on that image, You'll see in the next one. This is actually one of our competition drawings. Magazine A happens to have massively thick walls, eight foot thick walls, and next. very, very thick roof. Uh, we used that in a way to protect the interior and use this mass as a way of separating ourselves from the, uh, from the elements. So here you see a uh, stabilized berm that was there to protect from explosions. And you also see the tracks of the trolley cars, which used to be filled with black powder and then they went on a sort of aerial tramway down to the water. They were, I think they were actually munitions made from the black pub, carried then and then cabled down to boats in the harbor. So in general, we've determined that everything that is new should be new, but the elements that are old should have a, a, an indirect reference to what we saw on the site, and what we know Next. about Chinese gardens, about culture there interior of magazine A under construction. Uh, Next. I think one of the things that um, we were aware of was when we went into the ruins of this building, you felt uh, a release from certainly the heat, but also from um, the humidity, the, wall, the thickness of the walls. Next. Kept uh, the um, temperature really quite even. And so therefore it was decided that this would be next gallery space. Um, and the mechanicals occur underneath the, the floor, but they, uh, the space itself is very conducive to being um, a gallery. So the meandering canopy is also very much a characteristic of Chinese gardens. Here we're looking at the laboratory building, which was the most ruined of all the buildings and uh, working with Ivan, he, uh, as best he could, determined where the wood beams came from next. Um, and uh, this was almost entirely rebuilt because it was in such poor shape. Next. You can see that art is placed throughout the site, so events are, are occur throughout the site, so it is a, really a sequential. Here, this is, can also serve as a, a, as a meeting room, which is, occurs, or classroom and then it can be an event space uh, or a play space or 
play and learning space Next. for young people. So I think Asia Society continues to sort of um, change its programs, invent and reinvent usages. And next, what we try to do is take the buildings and uh, in a very careful way, both acknowledge the heritage, but in this case, Magazine B, construct a kind of um, box of um, use inside an existing heritage building. So it's a quite wonderful space for small concerts, for, Next. Uh, for movies, um, for, lectures. for lectures. Next. And I think once again, this is something we saw in the gardens of uh, Suzhou and Shanghai when we were first there, uh, that uh, wherever you look, there's something to, to see, a place to be. Next. One of the great things um, I think that one senses certainly about the pavilions in mm -hmm. Chinese gardens is that they were uh, created for kind of various activities. And um, they themselves are not uh, defining what the activities are. And I think the same thing is true with the Asian Society building. I mean, certainly we never imagined that it would be the site of uh, double deck yoga classes, um, but you never know what else is going to come up with. So here we are. I thought this was kind of an amazing picture. Next. Um, I so think, it's the platform for life. Yeah. Uh, and a platform for, for nature. And I think this is one of the best ways by which we can really join one another uh, as we move into a quite uncertain future. Uh, that is, we give more space, which is, is there for more different kinds of people and more use. The final images uh, after this uh, are of the rooftop, which often is serene and a little going on there and sometimes too much bathed in the heat. So you take Next. the lower bridge. Um, there was a wonderful art installation that has occurred up here. And dance performances. Next. So I think it stands as a sort of, um, as I said, Oasis, a kind of quiet place in a city that's always been about uh, kind of life, um, living commerce. This is one of the wonderful uh, ins installation, dance installation by the artist and dancer Shen Wei uh, some years ago. The, uh, we'll now move to the, uh, and, and talk a little uh, with less, more time, uh, more quickly about the Obama Presidential Center. We think that there's a, a strong relationship of this project to the yes. Asia Society in Hong Kong, although they are very different places. Uh, and we brought an image of Chicago, which maybe many of you have been to, but all of us know and think of it, one of America's most modern and uh, dynamic architectural cities, a little like uh, Hong Kong in this much is on a very, very beautiful body of water, in this case, a lake, Lake uh, Michigan. But so flat, Chicago, flat, flat. Oh, <laughs> flat, 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 it's true. Next. 1845, it was uh, just simply uh, a very, very, uh, almost an idyllic landscape. And then by 1871, the famous Chicago fire had occurred, and it had occurred because Chicago had grown so rapidly, so quickly, and made of the force that were had been in the area of wood that the, with the density of population, suddenly Next. when a fire occurred, the entire city was wiped out. Uh, by 1927, it had regrown and looked quite, uh, 1927 relative to Hong Kong, it would have been very modern today. It seems a little old fashioned. Next. But you can see Lake Michigan in the foreground and, and Chicago today, which actually uh, is almost laughable relative to the towers and the the mountains of Hong Kong and China. Yeah, but at any rate, this is the this is the place that President Obama uh, met his wife Michelle. Uh, uh, this is the site of, of, of the Jackson Park, which is directly south of the of the downtown Chicago, is on the lake. Um, we'll talk more about that, but it was built really also around 1870 Next. in a way to give some relief to the incredible urbanization that had occurred. And you can see very different from Chicago. The only real natural area here is Lake Michigan and these two relatively small parks. 
So these two parks uh, were designed by a um, very famous landscape architects in America called Olmsted and Vox, and they're connected by a kind of narrow strip. Um, and here you can see the relationship between the Obama home, which I think that they still own, which um, is a little further north and where Michelle Obama grew up. So when, when the president and first lady were thinking about where their presidential library should be. And I should say the presidential library is a unique uh, institution. Not so many people have visited these that are largely historical and they largely hold the papers and the history of the president and that presidential administration. They basically only exist for 14, 13 or 14 presidents at this time. Uh, the first one of which was FDR. Um, but at any rate, this is something that is, is important as a way by which we look back at the administration Next. and their work. Uh, but the south side of Chicago, uh, for those of you who know, is a place of uh, tremendous crime and deprivation and has been struggling for years as one of the... Um, uh, it's a really very underserved community. It's a very, very... Uh, it's been neglected. And, a long time. and it's a community of, of largely black community where, where actually there's a good sense of community, but also a very fractured sense of community. So it's an interesting site to be chosen uh, for the presidential library. Uh, his, he grew up in, in Hawaii. That was certainly a possibility and New York is a possibility, but they felt that by putting it in the south side of Chicago, they could address basically the place that they lived and met one another and the place that she was born. Um, so here you can see this, this is a, a drawing by Olmsted and Vox of their, what they imagined the park to be um, next. And one of the elements of the court is, is water. And once again, we see uh, the importance of water to the park and to the nurturing of the land. However, today, and this is an image of the site today, there's a six lane road running through on the right, that's usually very heavily trafficked. There was a football and artificial tra uh, tra running track and, and uh, football or soccer stadium uh, area, pardon me, field in the center. Uh, it was largely unused because it was bordered by these two highways. And it was difficult to get across the highways to the park. So the idea was that we would take that site, which was given to the president, uh, presidential library uh, for the presidential center. Now we call it a center because, uh, and we'll explain that in a moment. Next. You can see Chicago in the distance. So we're gonna just show some of the, um, really the sort of uh, images that we showed uh, in our competition because we were really competing with six other firms um, for this. And one of the, Things we wanted to start with were the principles, and um, because we feel that he is, and it was a presidency of principles. And the two words we focused on were enable and enable. Well, enable here, you can see him as a young man out working in the community and as a community organizer. And he's still, and that's still a very, very important aspect of the president's work today. In fact, he sees that it's the most important part of his work today. But in ennobling, it also said, well, here, for the first time ever, everyone, everyone has the chance to really become a president of the United States. And he actually ennobled all of us by letting us know that every single person counts, counts and every person can rise and, uh, and have a, a, a powerful role in society. So these two Next. elements really balance our thinking. And we, we ran that through, and we thought that storytelling, which is in a way magnifying, and that's a kind of fireside trick that most children played, uh, which is telling a story and making the story larger. is very, very important, and that our stories all count, and that story making, uh, which is that everyone's story counts. Well, and I think also he was very, uh, invested in the presidential center is very invested that not only they're telling the history of the Obama presidency, but more importantly, in making new stories. It's about training young people how to make new stories. 
So really the programming of that is, is not so terribly different from the Asia Society. Next. Uh, which is that uh, it's about community. So we use this as a diagram that we explained to them even before we showed them the, the, the basic early design, which is that establishing a landmark was important because everyone wanted to feel that this was a special place since this was such a special and unique president. So, yeah, so that's storytelling. And, and in, in fact, Next. The, the parks in Chicago are the places where museums occur. So we thought there should be a landmark element but then we also said, look, you just can't make a single landmark element that's too singular, that really uh, ennobles more than one really should. And so we said that if there's work to be done, let's create a campus. Let's realize that this is an ongoing educational journey for people. And it's a way by which we grow the, uh, the, uh, the park, bring people to the park, and then Bring people into buildings. So it's very related in many ways to the Asia Society because it's a series of buildings. It's not one singular building next. And another aspect where there is a sort of relationship to the Asia Society, on the water side, um, we have brought the earth up really actually over the top of the roofs of what is called the forum building and the library building. So the buildings are embedded into the landscape. From the street side, there's a plaza and you can see the buildings are open and you they're very, very visible. From the park side, actually, they feel much less visible. The museum tower, of course, is a, is a taller building. So that is still very much the storytelling. Story making happens really at ground level. Well, this is quite a large park. It's 21 acres, although that may be difficult to really understand when you're thinking about the topography of Hong Kong. And on the right here, we see President always loved basketball and believed that bringing young, young boys and young girls was physical well-being was, was part of it. The track has been moved uh, to, the, uh, to the south, or just off the map. Uh, there is uh, children's gardens, play, play areas, and, uh, and as Billy indicated, the, the forum, the library, and the museum, the museum is a tower. We'll see a couple Next. of images here now. How much time do we have? Okay. Well, this is an image. The, the project will go, probably go under construction and next year. We can see a number of the activities in the foreground on the park, including the uh, children's playground. And in the distance, the green plats there, there's something of the, the roof of the of a building where one plays basketball, the tower is probably the, the main uh, iconic element of the site. Next. So this is not a, a building that, that shrinks from the landscape. This is very much making a statement. However, I think the landscape is very, very important here. The buildings are all connected below grade through a series of recessed gardens. So the lower uh, floor, all the lower buildings will have uh, public spaces. There will be a public, a branch of the Chicago Public Library. Um, there are really low, all classrooms and um, meeting rooms, um, an auditorium, uh, a kind of general open space, which we call a winter garden, where people will be able to stop, have a cup of coffee, um, check their Wi-Fi. So it is both uh, clearly a building that is uh, a kind of monument to the presidency of President Obama, but it is a living, active, working learning center where young people both locally, nationally, and internationally will come to learn about civic engagement. The, uh, the lowest level of the tower will be completely open and free. There are three different levels there and the upper, the top level of the of the, uh, of the tower also is free and open to the public. So these are destinations anyone can go without paying a fee. Uh, you can inhabit this building and clearly it's a very different building than the glass towers of Hong Kong or of Chicago. Uh, we, we believe that buildings can be solid and actually also have plenty of light inside them. Uh, it's interesting, President Obama has been very involved in the sort of shaping of this tower um, he has actually mm -hmm. been 
Well, He's we... been an interesting critic. Um, and we, the words that you see up at the top are, will be words from an important speech of his. Next. Uh, actually, uh, that, that was maybe perhaps our idea, but certainly they're his words. He wants the building to have a sense of warmth inside it. Uh, this actually is part of the public level where one descends into gardens and as, begins to ascend into the tower. More this particular area happened, we, we label it rather curiously Obama-ness, but which is telling the story of the Obamas. Uh, next. It's been really an interesting There actually is journey. a public branch of the library here. Uh, yeah. Certainly all of the records of the of his tenure there, his eight years will be available digitally and some of the artifacts will be there, but he also believed that this area of Chicago needed a public library. And there will be a, a presidential reading room, which you sort of see through the big window at the back um, so that kids can come in. Local kids will be using the library, but they can also go into the reading room and actually take out books um, mm -hmm. that he, he himself has read. So he wants it to be a place of fun. On the roof of this particular building, there's a garden that in a way relates to the First Lady's garden at the White House and then the food and vegetables from that garden will be served in a restaurant uh, that's also part of the, uh, the center. It's called a center because it's, he doesn't see it as strictly a library. He sees it as an active park space. Next. So we are in the process of um, working on the construction drawings and um, we hope that we will be finished, well, we will be finished with construction drawings by late this fall. Um, the building has an interesting profile from each side. This shows escalators running up the north side and, and art will be actually embedded in the, the building. We're not showing it at the moment and also in the site, much as it exists at the Asia Society in Hong Kong. So the arts will play a role empowering everyone to have a voice and make their voice meaningful is Next. the primary work the president is doing today. Next, there's a program called My Brother's Keeper. Uh, these are early sketches of the, of the design of the tower where we would bring them to the president and he might critique them and say, I, I wonder whether we shouldn't shape, in a way, cut a corner here, to make it more dynamic, bring light into the center of the building. Next. We make models um, as all architects do and um, also study it, of course, in drawings, but for us, models still remain the primary design tool. Next. And at the very top of the building, this is a very tall space where anyone can come and, and through which you can look back through that, that speech that Billy talked about, which becomes a kind of sunscreen and, and a shield and, uh, and look out to the landscape beyond. Next. Um, and actually, this is one of our first thoughts um, that that there would be both a low building, but also a tall building. And a tall building would be in some way a beacon or a lantern um, that tells a story, many people's stories, just as this is a kind of form that we began with of um, using hands, different hands from people in the studio. So again, if we're talking about the way one designs, we try to use discussions about ideas and they're very, very, I would say they're often palpable ideas. This one actually being formed by hands of people in the studio to help us to, to understand what this could be, what it might be, the vessel that holds the light of the future. And with that, we're done with our presentation and look forward to discussions with Alice and Florence and, and those who are listening. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, Charles and Bailey. That was a fantastic sharing. Um, so um, just for all the audience, um, if you have any questions, feel free to, to send it over and then we will um, try to bring it up for discussion as well. Um, I would like to um, open up the discussion into like three main topics. Um, the first is about the Asia society in general. And then the second one will be about this, your second project that was presented, which is the Obama Presidential Center. And then the last one, um, I would like to talk, discuss something about the, your design process. 
So to start with the Asian society, maybe um, Alex, you might have something to start with. Yes, thank you, Florence. Um, I think this is really a great, um, uh, I, you know, I've talked to Billy and Todd over the years and, uh, and as a member of Asia Society in 1994, as a young person working in Hong Kong, um, I never, you know, uh, really would imagine that, you know, that I would be running the center um, this last eight years and really making use of the building. And uh, when I, I first arrived um, and saw this building, when I came back to Hong Kong in fall of 2011 and the scaffolding, the bamboo scaffolding was still up and, uh, and it was exactly, uh, I think it was 2011, June, um, that Asia Society moved into to the center. So really kind of falling in love with it because of the way, I had never seen the original, uh, the, the old building because uh, I moved to New York. And, but just the, the, the usage, the way you kind of the verticality and the connectedness. For me, uh, there's so many favorite, but the bridge, um, I, I, I call it the double decker bridge, which is very much like Hong mm -hmm. Kong, uh, that connectivity, uh, both high and low and having really worked with it. And, and I didn't, you know, the, 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 uh, just this last week, we've had mm -hmm. a lot of rain and going through that lower bridge is just, uh, and we've also been through a lot of storms uh, as well. So in terms of that, but you know, that bridge was originally not supposed to be that size. It was supposed to be very much um, uh, um, direct. Uh, so tell us about that bridge. Um, how did you guys come up, you know, the elbow shape and all that. And, and people also ask us, was it because for feng shui reasons <laughs> that the, the bridge is the way it is? But, you know, that bridge, the design, and somebody says it's overbuilt, but overdesigned, but it, it, it really, that solidness of that connectivity, um, I've always been curious how you guys came up with that. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so that, that's my question, is really about the bridge. Well, when we first encountered the, the, the jungle that is the site, uh, well, there were uh, many, many mosquitoes that may, may still be uh, you almost had to fight yourself for, through the foliage. It was impossible to walk on the site. It was slippery, and in fact, there were quite a few snakes that were there, not all of which were benign. So we thought that this idea of floating through the, the site would be critical. Um, of course, we thought about a direct bridge. We knew that the bridge would be expensive, and we felt that it should not look like an object, but should actually be an experience. We also knew that it needed to be practical because we we're already thinking in 2000 that, that accessibility would be critical for all, whether it was the young or the old, mm -hmm. the infirm, uh, and that one should uh, be able to find a way through the, the site as a journey. Well, and of course, Hong Kong has a, a kind of history of um, connections from building to building. And it's always, you know, when they've done it in the US, it's always a city killer. You know, it just takes people from the ground and and it makes the ground uh, barren. But in Hong Kong, it just makes the city uh, connected um, on multi-levels as a web, and it's very, very beautiful. So this uh, building on that idea of what exists in Hong Kong already and works and become, you know, we've seen how they become places of gathering uh, for many different kinds of people at different times. It, it seemed like a very natural way of you know, connecting sites that were at different heights and, you know, you had to cross the Nala. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we believe uh, the experience is more important than the object. Yeah. Uh, there's no question about that. I, I, we've created quite a, a, a visible object with the presidential center, but that's never our first instinct. Our first instinct is always for the experience. So the horizontal bridge really allows us to be part of the jungle and framing the jungle essentially one with it without all of the, the difficulties. Well, it's part of also the, I think, the um, lesson of a Chinese garden, because Chinese garden is really a series of experiences. And if you had to draw a map of what you did, most people would have a very hard time of mapping out their mm -hmm. path and what's around them. But they can see a sort of series, they can imagine a series of multiple experiences. And I think the Asia Society is very much thinking about a ser multiple series of experiences rather than a kind of overall, you know, iconic thing. Yeah. 
I, well, just to add to that discussion, I mean, as a visitor of the center, I usually, when I go to say the theater, I would go with one way in and then the other way out. I mean, the idea of having like a multiple experience within the journeys rather than having the same routes going in and out definitely enrich the, the experience a lot. Well, also another right. thing I wanted to, mm -hmm. uh, in light of what we're going through right now mm -hmm. with COVID, the outdoor space, mm -hmm. the way um, it's just uh, people feel safe coming. Mm -hmm. um, so this, you know, mm -hmm. designing outdoor space, and it sounds like with the Obama uh, Presidential Center mm -hmm. too, the, the importance of, um, uh, of the air and the trees. Um, and I think that's another experience that mm -hmm. um, you, along with the other two architects who, like you said, were trying to tame the jungle, mm -hmm. but you guys were kind of going with it. And, and in many of your buildings, you, the, the nature, the, the um, you kind of really embrace. And that is something that we want to thank you for because um, it's just being part of nature uh, is, is very, um, uh, kind of the parks that you were talking about with Obama said, it's really important. I think the more we think about it these past couple of months, um, yeah. it, it really has saved not only myself, but our colleagues' sanity to be able <laughs> to be outside yep. uh, with or without a mask on. And uh, so, so that is something that, that it's really, um, uh, we're really grateful for. Mm -hmm. And also the height. And, and I noticed that's another area that you have, uh, people also have commented on for us is that in, in Hong Kong, everything is so low, uh, but just going through the jockey club hall and maybe because uh, uh, Phil, uh, Todd is so tall, uh, <laughs> but the height of, of buildings, just the m majesty and it looks like you're also bringing that to the Obama Center. Just it, it talk about, can you talk about that, that decision? I'm sure there were um, a conflict because, uh, and you've worked with Ronnie and other, you know, to be like, there's, you know, heights cause. Uh, <laughs> so does an elbow bridge rather than a straight bridge. Um, well, you have to be a little sly on all of this, I have to say for the architects. Um, no, there's, uh, we, I actually love differences. I, I do love small spaces and small people. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I like differences most of all. Uh, I like the idea of uh, compression and release. So I would say that we talk a great deal about the idea of compression and release, intimacy, and, uh, and the public. Well, I think one of the reasons that we like to work also for um, nonprofit institutions is they always come with an aspiration. and. And the, the desire to sort of make, essentially, in, it's, a, it's a simplified way, but make the world better, make the world a better place. And so um, I think a lot of the decisions then, certainly they're always financial decisions. You can't do a building without financial decisions, but they're also aspirational decisions. They're also times when you choose one thing over another because you know it will mean more to more people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it's actually a couple of the um, audience were asking the same questions. So uh, the design process for this Asia society, it has been quite a long process. It's almost like 10 years, right? Um, what are the, the major challenges you see during the process? Well, our presidential center is lasting longer also than we expected. Challenges are certainly time and energy. Um, one of the reasons that, the, but the nature of our studio, well, we're going to eventually be old, sold and be gone, but, but the nature of our studio is not to move quickly forward. Um, we work together because we like to be together and we learn from one another. So rather than conquering the world by splitting the studio into two, one led by me and one led by Billy, we decided we wanted to work together because we like to be together because we think that two people's ideas sorted out properly are better than one person's ideas. So I think it basically is part of the way we work. Now, when projects go 10 years, we were just talking about this, clearly you're, you're in trouble. Uh, how can we keep employees on the same project over those many years? But it's basically, we attempted to do that as best we can. Yeah. We believe in continuity and uh, we, we believe in the endurance of a, of a marathon rather than a sprint. 
Mm -hmm. Great. You have um, to believe. That's yeah. the biggest challenge. And then you have to pace yourself. Then you have to figure out how to pay for it. <laughs> Belief and money. Yeah. yeah. So what do you see as uh, the similarities in the design process or, and also the differences between the, the Asian Society and the Obama Presidential Center? Well, I think for me, both of them begin with a higher goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, although the Obama Center is clearly focused on <clears throat> a personality uh, and a person, um, its actual driving force is about a kind of sense of education, bridging and connection that has always been the driving force of the Asia Society. Mm -hmm. So I feel that they're very, very united in a kind of mission of connecting people and making people feel like they have their own power and they have their own voice. They, and each person has something to say. Yeah. Well, I agree. I think it, it, they both share the idea that the answer doesn't... We had an instinct for the horizontal garden in the vertical city. But making that happen has to do with other people. It has to do with whether it was Patrick Chung or, or Grace, Chang. Grace Chang or Mary Lee Turner or, or the land or the buildings. <laughs> the same thing is happening with the, uh, the presidential center. Uh, we, we have to listen to the community. We have to listen to the president. We have to believe in our own ideas and we have to slowly allow them to evolve into a place where we have something that is coherent. So I think these are actually very difficult. Uh, it's a deep struggle, but it's the most rewarding struggle have as architects because we're we're trying to do something meaningful in this world and i think the most meaningful thing is the struggle to actually um make a better world through the connection with other people mm -hmm. i totally agree as a architect, i also felt like um as much as the reward is from the building itself but the process the process of meeting these new people to discuss and have a common goal in achieving like a project is, is definitely something that is very time specific and also very rewarding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like because it is the process. I mean, we, we so much wish we could be in Hong Kong right now because <laughs> uh, looking at our building, uh, you know, 10 years later, it would be a delight. Uh, revisiting the site and the people you, uh, Alice, and, and so on would be just incredible. So if that's not part of the reward, I don't know what is. So. Well, we're going to get you back, uh, you know, before when we can travel again, um, as we continue to celebrate our um, anniversary, which is Asia Society celebrating 30th this year. But in 2022, when this building, when we've been here officially 10 years, uh, and this is one of, another reason we want to have this discussion. It was 20 years ago that the two of you first um, came to this jungle and then <laughs> you you in your way have just helped us um, manage if not tame it but just really integrated mm -hmm. our our programming uh, around it so I really want to thank you for that and mm -hmm. um, yeah I also have a, a question which is more about the material the choice of material okay so in the Asia society there was a combinations of like stones existing bricks concrete um, all these choices of materials in, in, in this building. And you, you, you kind of also mentioned about something about the stone and the, and, and the green stone and all that, um, which a variety of materials exist in this, this project. So comparatively speaking, in the Obama uh, Center that you just showed, it appears to be a little more monolithic in the sense that it seems like the same kind of like a limestone uh, kind of choice of material of cream color stone has been kind of uniformly applied both to the tower and to the library and to these other complexes. Can you tell us more about your, your, your thoughts on material in general and specific also to this uh, Obama Center? Um, <clears throat> well, I think we are, um, it's true, it's, a, it's a generally a sort of more monolithic stone. Although we're looking at stone, we haven't chosen a stone yet, it's a granite, which will have, um, stone often comes from the same quarry in two different, in different flavors. Mm -hmm. So sometimes within the same quarry, you can find uh, a more vivid pattern and a more quiet pattern. 
So we're looking at stones that might be uh, sister stones, but you know, one is the louder one and one is the quieter one. Mm -hmm. And thinking about how we can use that um, or other stones that have um, a quite a, a sort of warmer uh, a texture. I think the two primary um, materials that you'll sense as a visitor um, are a sense of quiet stone and then green. Uh, because I think one of the major ask, one of the major um, uh, materials will be the sense of green and the park because this will these will be low buildings as well with trees and park um, Michelle Obama's garden on top of the library so that the landscape which is being done by Michael Van Valkenburg's studio will be a very powerful player as an integrated uh, piece of the whole complex. Yeah, I, I, there will be other materials, there's no question, but we need to do, have a, a relatively simple palette. Uh, but as Billy says, this stone, the granite we're going to choose will have a very, very large and vivid pattern on it, particularly when it rains. It'll be an American granite. We had a great deal of research actually from stones all around the world and eventually settled with the president's desire on one that was American, uh, a granite that would be enduring and a granite that had uh, flair, because we think the president has flair. Wood will play an important role, although a secondary role. Um, concrete will play a role, there's no question about that. And we also wanted to back off and make sure that the activities, the people, the things that happen there have a very, very important role, that they are at the foreground. It's all about the people and about what happens there. The president is absolutely convinced that the future is in the hands of the young and those that have not been born yet. And it wants to be their stories and for their 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 lives. So backing off on, on making it too rich was actually uh, really an important discussion. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, so um, so as we start talking about the, the Obama Presidential Center, um, with the recent movement on the racial equality in the US, um, it, it certainly touches every of our hearts, um, reminding us the tough battle that um, some of the colored Americans are fighting every day. So for you to be the architects that, that are working on a presidential center, but not any work presidential center, but this one, which is for Obama. And for you as an architect that you talk a lot about values, a lot about beliefs, um, when you are developing your ideas for your buildings. Um, not that I want to tie everything to, uh, back to architecture, but, but as an American, as well as, as American architects that is working on this presidential center, can you share your thoughts on how, how these recent events are inferencing or giving you any other thoughts on the design in general? Well, I, I can, it's, it's complex. Over the years, four years we've been working, we've maybe met with the president nearly 30 times. He's mm -hmm. very involved. I should say right now, more than ever, he's involved in the programs to help young people find their voice, help create equality. Uh, he, he recognizes that uh, he may not be supportive of the President Trump's uh, presidency, but he, he still feels there's work to be done. So one of the things we've been doing, we've been struggling with budget because uh, he wants to put more and more emphasis into programs, which is important. We're also trying to protect our building. And I think we've made our, our building will become more, has been become more flexible uh, in the, in the uh, as we, this last year, as we begin to see that answers are less clear and open, uh, sort of creation of new programs will be will be more important. Uh, certainly outdoor space and, and distancing will be part of that. Um, uh, ex uh, radical accessibility is a is a term that we had never experienced, but which may be there. And uh, we're trying to find that radical accessibility, I should say, uh, even if we've had a budget struggle, he's absolutely committed to being this, this being a net zero building. Uh, so it will be an all electric building. We'll have geothermal. It will be uh, incredibly well insulated. So we have 
many things to protect because many of these values, which are longer term values, are really values for all of the people and uh, for the longevity of the building. I mean, I think Todd's absolutely right. There are, are certain things that um, just make very deep sense. So we have to make sure that our decisions make very deep sense in terms of the longevity and how the building contributes um, to a more positive uh, environment and sustainability. I think one of the things that I'm feeling very strongly now um, with the movement in America is that um, to try to listen more. Um, mm -hmm. And I think one of the things as architects, we're trained that we know the answers, that we give the answers, that we lead. I think we don't, I think we need, as I'm talking to students that are now in architecture school, I think we need to understand that we actually follow yeah. and that we need to be better at listening than at telling. And I think one of the, the, one of the things that's happening now is people realize that they have assumptions about certain kinds of people, assumptions, and that you think you know. Um, I read a really interesting poem where it was a dialogue between oh, two friends, two poets, white poet, black poet. And then the end, you know, the, the white, the black poet begins the white poet response. And he says, you know, I stand beside you, I support you. Um, it said, but I know I am not you. And I think understanding that we need to listen so that we can, we will never be that other person, but to really hear rather than assuming that we know uh, all about what that other person wants and what that other person does. And that is not only racially, that is, I think, uh, between how we work with other people. Mm -hmm. That's very true. It's, it's kind of like, even when we are working just with our clients, trying to listen is, is always a, of a primary importance. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's hard because although Billy says we have to lead with listening, uh, we also have to lead. <laughs> and so if we, but I think through listening, we can gain wisdom. And the, then the, the leading through listening and the wisdom that comes from listening actually also permits you to lead a little better. And that's why at least our journey together has been very, very rich one, um, mm -hmm. because I, I know that though we struggle many times with what the answer is, it's not her answer or my answer, but one that we both believe in. So during this process, uh, you have been working on this for how many years now for the Presidential Center? About four, About four years. Oh, so during that- It was, years, to, it yes. was supposed to be two years. Yeah. <laughs> it was supposed to be two um, years. <laughs> um, so during that four years, um, what did you hear the most um, from, from during the process? Interesting. <laughs> I think, um, I think, I don't think the president said he wanted to make this the opposite of other presidential libraries. <laughs> Now, there haven't been that many presidential libraries and we visited them, um, but finding out what the opposite of something is, is very difficult <laughs> because first you need to know the thing and then you need to know what it means to be the opposite. Um, so I would have said that the, what I've heard mostly is many more voices than I ever expected. Um, mm -hmm. And that's frustrating, I should say, not all happy because if he comes into a room, uh, he will be, he's interested in every person's voice and ultimately to listen and then he comes up with, with his, his thoughts. Uh, but that has been pervasive throughout the entire project. Sure. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, I didn't say it was easy to listen. <laughs> <laughs> it's frustrating, time consuming, annoying, and, uh, but it also has been the re a reward. We know it will be a reward. Yeah. Okay, so um, I would also like to ask a few questions about the design process, because tonight um, our audience uh, include Asian Society members, um, um, AIA members, as well as uh, some of my students. Um, so 
when I was uh, with my student, like some from time to time, I will always hear the questions about like, oh, I got stuck. I don't know how to come up with a design ideas. Um, with you guys, um, certainly you listen to your your you listen to the site, you listen to your client, you listen to the program. Um, but certainly um, there is an inspirational moment that gets you do with what you are doing that is make the design unique. So can you tell us something about like your design process and any advice for students if they have a hard time getting ideas? Well, at least for me, one of the good things is I think I have ideas, mm -hmm. but actually I don't. <laughs> so I, 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 I usually am the first to speak and Billy uh, usually takes her time and uh, helps me to understand what maybe the idea is inside the idea. So I certainly think that a student shouldn't think that they have to bring ideas out by themselves. It could be a teacher or a friend, but I, I do think sharing these things that are, you feel are dear to yourself, but something that is very, very felt very important is, is a starting point and allowing that to, with the help of others, uh, actually become visible. So let's try the Asia Society. The first instinct was that we wanted it to be a jungle, and we wanted it to we wanted to live in the jungle, and we wanted it to be a horizontal garden. But in the end, and in a very aggressive city, so we said if we're going to do this, we actually need to be very aggressive with our humble idea. Mm -hmm. I'd say that could be a Chinese way of working too, uh, which is that if you're going to be humble, you better be strong. Mm -hmm. And I think we can talk about those ideas. And from a humble idea, you can build strength. Mm -hmm. but from a strong idea, you might be able to build humility. But I, I, I think, um, you know, I think this idea of these sort of two poles and you try to bring them together, I think, um, and I'm surprised that you said that, uh, you sort of, talked about it in that way because I would have thought that what you would have said is you, be, you begin by solving the problem. Um, uh, because if, you, if you're trying, if before you start, if I'm talking to students now, but like if before you try to solve the problem, you're trying to imagine, you know, some scenario, like, I don't know, this, um, it has to do with a starship. Mm -hmm. And then you try to solve the problem with that. That's very, very difficult. But if you keep in mind your sort of <clears throat> general idea, kind of maybe let's call it the more creative idea, but you begin with solving the problem, then you can start to see how that sort of more uh, lyrical idea or poetic idea can push you in certain directions. But the problem gives you very good foundation and you can sort of like get busy and feel like you're doing stuff and not just sort of swimming around in a sea without any kind of thing to grab onto, because the problem gives you something to grab onto. So start to solve the problem. I mean, we start with like squares uh, of, you know, square footages of program and just sort of do the very basic relationships. But then as they start to resolve themselves, then this idea, another idea of a kind of jungle or how do you make this feel you know, in certain levels, like music, like there's a crescendo. So I think two things are going on at once. Um, you're solving the problem, but then the salt, pepper, spices come in and they push you in another direction. Well, I, I certainly agree. It is true that sometimes the starting point is, and often the starting point is just solving the problem. It's the easiest you, place you, to start. Well, identifying. Yes and no. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it buys you time, but if you can't get off that, Jag, no, you you're, you're in trouble. So that's where you might need a friend uh, or a critic. Yes, the president actually is pretty good that way. Mm -hmm. He's also been annoying. But <laughs> sometimes your best friends are. Okay. Right. Or your partner. <laughs> okay. We now have uh, a lot of questions coming in. Mm -hmm. Many of them, I think, are students or people who are interested in architecture. One question talking about uh, teaching or, or are architects, uh, as architects who teach or have taught, uh, how do you see relationship between the two acts 
uh, teaching and designing? Well, I think uh, first, uh, I think we're primarily architects who build and secondarily teachers. It's a little like the same discussion we had before, which is that you need to have the one balancing the other, uh, but you also need to know which side of the, of the fence I think you primarily stand on. And ours is the, the, the idea of practitioners, but teaching has been incredibly valuable to us, not just because the students have ever, are amazing, which they always are, and they've always been, um, but because it helps us to formulate our own ideas and to discuss other people's ideas. And also, I think um, it ties you into what young people and students feel are important issues and um, exciting directions. I mean, it's very easy as anybody who practices to know how engrossing it is to do what you do every day and to sort of be forced to look up and then look into the distance, which happens when you teach, um, I think is a great gift to us. So we'll be teaching this fall. Um, you know, it's our first uh, experience teaching. I think we're gonna be teaching both in person, but also it will be online. So it will be an interesting uh, stretching for us. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, an interesting question. Uh, any experience uh, facing pressure from local communities? Um, do you, did you manage to turn the opinion around? And if so, uh, did you succeed? Is that specific to a particular project? Uh, it didn't, it's, but I imagine it's talking about maybe the Obama Center, but any it pressures from local communities, um, you know, yeah. or, I don't know, um, society, but you do have to, you know, uh, like you say, you work with many of the nonprofits. Well, I, I, yeah. I mean, we, we had pressure certainly on, on the Obama Center, although some of it was, you know, it was not so much architecture. It was a lot of um, issues about hiring and um, local community, which was really not so focused on us. We also had pressure <clears throat> on a project that we did uh, moving an art collection from one place to another. I mean, I think this is one of the times when you really um, have to be aware of what's going on. Um, you have to present your work in a public and as transparent a manner as possible. And then you have to not pay attention to any social media because that can completely distract you. And you just have to focus on doing the best work you can given a kind of sense of what, what you know, the kind of voices that are around you, but then you need to make a, a kind of bubble for yourself. Um, I think it's, I think, you, the problems with community are never that if the community has a very strong idea and a clear idea, you listen. There's no question about it. But usually the community is full of different ideas. And so the sorting out of those ideas and listening to them and eventually helping to mediate an answer is uh, through the building is probably the skill that is a very, very important skill. It occurs in almost all projects where we uh, never expected we had to listen to the community would just be the client. Uh, so that's always an abrupt and sometimes difficult challenge. Uh, in the case of the presidential center, there were two conflicting things. One would be people who wanted parking on the site, which drove me personally crazy um, because I didn't believe there should be any parking on the site whatsoever. Uh, and then those who wanted absolutely the site to be free and clear. But the fact is that in, in the end, it gave us a very, very large underground parking garage, which I'm not thrilled with, but which made the people who wanted the park to be all park, or most all park, happy, and the people who wanted to be able to drive their cars to there their, to be happy. Of course, it was expensive as a budget uh, challenge, and it, and it will be, uh, and we need to make a beautiful and safe garage. I mean, in the end, um... I think one can only do the best work you can, and then the building will make, will either solve those people's issues 
or it will not. I mean, I, I think all you can do, you can never, um, especially now that with social media, everyone can make a comment. You will never be able to please everyone. That's an impossibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, and also I wanna thank you both. Uh, we technically do not have parking here at Asia Society in Hong Kong. And thank you for that uh, because that is one less concern. Uh, we have a nice parking down the street from the Pacific <laughs> place. So that does solve a lot of our, our issues when people ask if we have parking. So thank you. Uh, and, but, and this is an, an interesting question too from a, 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 our online audience. Being in New, being in New York, uh, was it a conscious decision uh, to go after uh, more cultural institutional projects um, and, uh, and not really work with developers? Absolutely. <laughs> very, very clearly. We, uh, we did some commercial work when we were young and it was largely interior work. Um, and although it was lucrative and we could pay the bills with that, uh, as we gained confidence and saw that we might be able to do work that had a higher aspiration, we were very conscious in trying to reduce and eliminate the other, uh, of course, we were lucky. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, it's like finding a, a relationship with somebody. Over time, you realize, you know, what it is you're looking for. And different people look for different things in their work. And um, which is not to say, you know, that somebody's partner is the wrong partner. You just find your way in your own partner. And so uh, we've always been interested in a kind of um, in the worlds of art and literature and, and pub the public space. And so it's, it's work that feeds us intellectually and emotionally. And so that's the work towards which we gravitate. And I know that there are other, you know, people find their other directions through other ways. So we're not saying one thing is better than another, we're saying, this is, this is our way, this is the way we chose. It was a conscious decision. I mean, one of the things that's always told um, young people, students, um, is that when you're very young, sometimes it's easier to know what you don't wanna do than what you wanna do. And that helps you uh, move through life and eventually it helps to define what you do wanna do. Um, so it's like, you know, it's like that bad relationship when you get into something with, a you know, it's a bad thing. It tells you, okay, I'm not going to go in that direction anymore. And, and it helps you find your way. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> at this point of your career, is there any other type of projects that you want to do, but you still don't get a chance to do? Well, it's interesting. Um, there are many things. First, I wish our own studio were more diverse. I wish we could attract uh, and actually have more people of, of color, really dark color. I, uh, we're beginning to want, I very much want to do uh, low cost housing, mm. uh, particularly if there's a value behind it, not just to produce low cost housing, but to, to, yeah. that's, that is affordable. Um, I think that would be the most rewarding. In fact, uh, right next to us where we are living in this warehouse where we are working, we're creating a few units of affordable housing next to us, working with the local community. And that's been very, very rewarding. Now, the problem is that they have so little money that we actually are doing this work gratis. And that's not supportable. We can't do that for free. Um, I don't know that we'll be able to do that. I don't know that our society will be willing to pay fees to us to do work for uh, the people who most need it. But that would be the work I would most like to do now. Well, I think- uh, it would not mean a, a very fancy building, pardon me? No, we're running low on time. This is uh, one minute to go. Um, and I wanna take this opportunity to thank um, uh, Billy and Todd and Florence uh, for joining me in uh, tonight's discussion. Um, I know we can you know, uh, have another hour, an hour and a half, and I hope we will uh, have the opportunity of welcoming you both back in person uh, 10, 20 years after your first visit. And also, um, you know, now that we've been here over 10 years, almost 10 years, 
um, just how beautiful and, and just despite the COVID uh, situation, mm -hmm. our um, membership is still steady and also our viewership. And thanks to a program like this, uh, we, uh, I think in, we found out in the month of May, our viewership was over 30,000 uh, wow. for our online programming. And as beautiful mm -hmm. as the place you design, uh, the Jockey Club Hall can seat up to over 300. Um, it's wonderful that we have now, thanks to um, this uh, <laughs> opportunity, to share ideas and, and, and the boundary uh, in some ways, we're really living in a borderless world. Uh, unfortunately, the COVID has proven uh, that to be true, but also information. And here in Hong mm -hmm. Kong, we are still very grateful uh, to, to the two of you. And also, um, I think uh, Billy mentioned earlier, I uh, think the pioneers, uh, people like Ronnie, people mm -hmm. like Jack Wattsworth. And I know Mary Lee uh, Turner is out there watching in New York. And I want to thank them for really uh, having the vision. And I think this is an area where I think having the vision to build the site and also um, in, our, in our way, thanking the government to, uh, to also to help us uh, give us the site in the first place and that we can make it um, a part of the community. And this is uh, one of the things that we've been able to bring um, uh, programmatically. I think uh, Billy saw the opera, uh, Mila, when we premiered it in uh, North America in New York. And it's also to bring in programming of, of the voices of the less heard um, for uh, that we can bring to the audience. And uh, so I'm really, really grateful uh, to Asia Society and um, our, our members and our supporters for being allowing us to do what we do. And I really, I've mentioned to many people, I really have one of the best jobs in the world. Um, and also at this time like this to be the bridge, I think, uh, mm. I think we've touched upon it. There's so many divisions um, as a Chinese American seeing the, the um, and also the, the, the Black Lives Matter in Hong Kong, we've seen the protests. There is so many uh, divisions these days. Mm -hmm. And for us to be um, an organization that is bridging. And every time I walk either the upper deck or the lower deck, the Yatsumoto Bridge or the, or the Fruit Bat Bridge, I, it reminds me of how important the work we do um, continue, and and you know, and I'm really thankful for uh, uh, you know uh, hearing more about the Obama Presidential Center mm -hmm. and the kind of work uh, uh, that center is going to bring on uh, to the community, which truly, truly needs it uh, in this time. So thank you, and thank, thank you, you, our audience, for being with us, and uh, and we look forward to welcoming you back either online or offline uh, in the near future, and uh, and look forward to welcoming. Um, Billy and Todd back to Hong Kong uh, when we can travel again. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.